Good evening. How are you all? Good to see you. It's fun to have this small venue to really talk and, and have a conversation. As you'll see, I'm really passionate about this work. Um, I am fortunate enough to be um, with the Front Porch family of companies, and I hold several hats. For the last 17 years, I've led technology efforts and innovation for the Front Porch family. And for the last three to five years, I've also been the president of the Front Porch Center for Technology, Innovation, and Well-Being. Front Porch and who we are, uh, we're a family of nonprofit companies. Um, we focus on creating communities, and we do that by believing in the individual. Um, I leave that up there uh, at the beginning because that in itself is a technology challenge right out of the chute. If you're truly going to believe in the individual and help aggregate into, into the community, that defines kind of the direction strategically and technologically that we're always, the challenge we're always facing. How do we go to the very specific and granular and personalized and yet bring it out in a connected way. Uh, Front Porch has all of the traditional um, services. We do independent living, assisted living, skilled nursing, memory care, um, uh, basic supportive services. We also uh, do affordable housing. And there we serve predominantly seniors, but we also serve uh, the chronically mentally ill and also uh, low-income families with children. So we have a, a really large, diverse population of people we support. Altogether, about 6,000 lives, primarily in California, a little bit in Arizona, and then we hop over to uh, Louisiana and Florida. Some were a little geographically confused. <laughs> uh, one of the ways uh, that uh, we uh, approach our work is developing centers of excellence. When we find a problem that's particularly challenging or that we really think is particularly worthwhile that we get really excited about, we build a center of excellence. And that's how the Front Porch Center for Technology, Innovation, and Wellbeing came into existence. There, uh, we uh, launched in, I think, 2008, 2009, uh, a separate nonprofit that's focused on innovative uses of technology to help people live well, particularly in their later years. So as we mentioned, we serve kind of a diverse population, the predominantly older adults, but we're also very aware that a lot of the work we do can apply to multiple populations, and that excites us. And it's kind of something that Katie mentioned in her 2.0 vision. We share that. Um, basically, our premise is that we think technology has an important role to play in helping people live well. If you know me at all and you've met me before, you'll know that I'm very clear. Technology is not the answer. And that's just a difficult thing to say in a room like this. It, it's the tool. And it's very important that you appreciate that it's a tool. And it's about embedding it in an ecosystem and a total approach. Um, and we work really hard on both aspects of that, what you'll see. Uh, we have basically three core strategies. Our work falls into three buckets. We have a whole portfolio of, of pilots that we're running where we're working with uh, established tech companies and emerging tech companies on their solutions that are at all different parts of their lifespan. Their early prototypes are thinking about what they do. They're already in the market, but they really want to figure out how to make them hum. They're somewhere in between. Big and small pilots. Um, and we have the, the portfolios, it's like constant care and feeding. Some of the pilots are wrapping up. They're short pilots, seven weeks. Some of the pilots are two years. A whole variety. The other thing we do is we started out with pilots. That was our initial focus. Our belief was if we could find the technologies and match them with the needs of uh, particularly the older adult population, and we could kind of figure out uh, where the sweet spots were, we could test those, find the ones with legs, and diffuse them. Um, what we found when we got started was we immediately ran into the whole, it's a tool, yes, we knew that, and we've got to solve the whole ecosystem. We've got to put together the partners. And as we've grown in this work, uh, and you'll see in a minute, a big part of our work now is actually aggregating partners. Um, you'll find um, my belief is that this is a very collaborative space. I actually strongly share Katie's view. Um, this is too big of a problem. We need to move too quickly, and no one group can do it by themselves. Um, and so we're real proud of the collaborations we've continued to develop, and now it's becoming a full-time activity for us. And we'll talk more about it. Um, and then we just exist in the world to bring together new ideas that kind of tip, tip things over. Um, we love to come to places like this and hear what people are doing, and we bring that back into our organization and community of partnerships and share because we want to advance the thinking. We have... I'll just put all these up there. We have picked six primary focus areas for our work. The first one that we started with was the one we found that the population we work with cared 
passionately about, and that was assisting and maintaining brain health. And I mean, if you're aware of the report that was published in the last 30 days about how one in three people at the time of death has some type of cognitive impairment, um, this is a very, very important issue. I am going to talk about this specifically as it impacts uh, the entrepreneurs in this space. Second area that we focus on is anything that we can do to enhance social connectedness, reduce isolation, depression, all the things that fall out of that. Uh, related to that, we work on things that could promote engagement and growth. Very important, um, we work on giving people proactive, participatory, participatory control over their own health and wellness. We really don't want to react to events. We want to get ahead of that curve. Um, anything we can do to prevent emergencies or serious events before they occur. And then, of course, the really important issue of caregiving, um, both formal and informal caregivers, and what can we do to put tools in their hands to support them. Our research interests, we definitely focus on getting pilot initiatives that have measurable outcomes. Um, and we do that in two ways. We work with formal research partners, USC, UCSF, um, where we have evidence-based research um, and we're developing the outcomes and publishing the results. We also go the other end of the spectrum. There is a very real need to do small market user design acceptance testing type pilots. They help uh, the entrepreneurial companies significantly. We always work to get outcomes out of those, but they're less formal, less structured than the formal research you do at the academic level. We do both. Just to kind of give you a sense, like this is a, a diagram that describes a very large project we have running for two years. We're doing, we're building a model e-health community for aging in Koreatown here in Los Angeles. We have funding from the California Telehealth Network and UC Davis um, to do a very complex and elaborate project where we have UCSF, uh, University of San Francisco, as our research partner. We're developing outcomes in all those areas and, and we'll be publishing our results. So we can do really big, formal, robust st studies and then we do other smaller ones, just depending on the need. And we try really important, uh, we try really hard to make the study or the pilot be specific to what's gonna make a difference for everyone concerned. Our approach is pretty fundamental. We listen, we listen, we listen, we listen. And I'm going to talk about that because I think a lot of people have ideas in this space, but they're not listening. I hate to be candid, but I've been doing this a long time. And um, you have to listen. And, and when I mean listen, I mean actually hear it, right? Don't ask the question and don't hear it and don't do something about it. But you really have to listen to what the population has to say about what works. We try to learn, learn what the opportunities are to meet those needs. We plan uh, and spend a lot of time researching what the options are and how we can uh, implement our pilots. We implement them. We spend, and I don't know if you can read this, but we spend a huge amount of time in education. And I'm going to talk about that too. And then we just kind of complete the learning loop over and over and over again until we get it right. Collaboration is key to this work. We're really proud of the partnerships we've been able to develop. We're working with all kinds of really wonderful people. And I, I share this not so much to brag, but it's to encourage you. If you have an interest in this space, don't go it alone. Come and network with Katie. Come and network with anyone you can. There are tons of people that have interest in this area, and what we found is they're all willing to share. It's too big of a challenge to do by yourself. This is key. In terms of, um, Katie asked me to kind of give some examples of the work we've done. Uh, we have um, two large grants over the last two years that we've been working on. We had um, from the Center of Technology and Aging an mHealth grant where we tested um, medication management with older adults using cell phone texting. Um, and that pilot's just recently wrapped up. We used UCSF as our formal research partner. We're also, as I mentioned, doing uh, the two-year um, model e health community here in Koreatown. Um, well, we also have worked with a whole variety of technologies, sensor technology, brain fitness technology, social networking technologies. I'm particularly proud of this slide over here in the corner. This is called Never Say You Can't Do It. That is a computer health literacy training for older adults where they're using a, a mobile computing lab set up in two different senior centers across LA with video conferencing between them being taught in Korean and teaching in language how to source health literacy information to put people in control of their own health information over the internet. Is that I believe that St. Barnabas and what's the other site, Davis? Towers. Vista Towers. Yeah. 
Um, so I mean, we really uh, don't take no for an answer. We're willing to try and figure out anything. Um, we had so many people uh, attend uh, those uh, mobile computing classes that we had to uh, actually get more money to get more laptops and let more people in. So, um, but these all the pictures you'll see throughout this are actually uh, real work that we're doing right now uh, around uh, all over our system. We've also done work with iPads and mobile technology. We're doing work with telehealth right now through our uh, Model Health community for aging. Um, we're doing remote health monitoring um, as well as we've done a lot of work with extra game health technology, um, technology enabled health assessments, health and wellness assessments, and uh, a lot of work in digital literacy for older adults. Um, and again, these are samples of different technologies that we're working with now currently or have recently. So, from my perspective, <laughs> I've been doing this a long time as a technologist for a long-term care senior living provider. I've been working very specifically in the area of pilots, specifically putting technology directly in the hands of older adults to see what will work, what the needs are, how we can do it. And the question is, is affordable personalized digital aging fact or fiction at this point? And this is my answer, having worked in this for quite some time. It's a little bit of both at this point. And I think it's really important to say that. Why do I say that? Well, it's a fact. It's a fact it's going to be a reality for all the reasons that Katie laid out and for all the reasons that you're here in the room. All the companies that are starting to get going are actually going to develop the products. And more than anything else, there is this tremendous need. Okay? Uh, Katie had a statistic, I don't see, I don't know if you saw it up on her slide, but it's one of the most compelling statistics around. I think she had like 75 million older adults, boomers coming, and 3 million residential housing care beds. I mean, I don't like to use the word care beds, but housing opportunities, rooms, units, okay? There's an incredible mismatch, right? And on top of that, there's an overall preference. 90% of the people want to age in place, okay? so. You put all that together, the demand is there, the need is there, and the mark, the kind of the product providers are starting to come together. But is it a reality? No. Is affordable personalized digital aging a reality today, where it's widely used and people really can get what they want? The answer is no. Uh, and, and that's hard to say, especially as someone who works in this space. But it just isn't there. And that's what we've the problem we've got to solve. So, here's my answer. Um, as to what we got to do. That's just a short list. <laughs> That's like Katie had a 10 minute limit on my talk. So, <laughs> But I want to run through this because I think there's some really important things that you need to hear. First of all, the collaboration has to increase. Do it here, do it anywhere you can. Those of us that work in this space know different forms for collaboration. If you're new to this and you really want to work in this space, come along and have the conversation. You'll find it's a really wide open space people like to share. Um, don't guess. Katie's point about you may have had a personal experience that might have driven you to this, that's great. That gives you the motivation. Don't guess. Do the research and really listen and then take it. We actually, as Katie said, we do uh, bring in a lot of companies in to actually talk to our residents and our populations, listen to their needs, and then literally go out and don't develop to what they heard. They didn't hear it. It happens way too often and it's a real problem. Plan for the village. What do I mean by that? Aging is a village experience. There's an older adult. There's generally a community contact. There's family members. There's healthcare providers. And what I see a lot of solutions providers doing right now is only developing a solution for one part of the equation. Right? Plan for the village. So plan that the information that you're collecting or the service that you're providing might be accessed by the older adult, might be accessed by the family member, might be accessed by the healthcare provider, might be accessed by the neighbor. Think it through up front. Right? What we're seeing is a lot of people adding this type of thing in afterwards, and it's incredibly, uh, we, we see people just check things by the wayside. It's not in their data structure. They didn't really think it through, and they can't adapt. Um, build, build in choice, <laughs> seriously. What does choice mean? As someone who's going to spend money on this now, both as a family member and or as a senior um, care provider, don't limit me to a particular hardware platform. Give me options. Don't define what a hardware platform means to you. I might want to use a TV, a smartphone, an analog phone, a computer, and I want the freedom to choose all of that. And why do I want that freedom? Because the people I serve want that freedom. 
and I can't lock up their choices because they won't work with me. So it's a very important thing that TV has to come into this equation. Mm -hmm. And it's not there right now. People are jailbreaking things and slowly getting permission uh, from LG and others to do stuff, but um, it's they're writing it into the basic operating systems of the TV. It's not truly an app. It's not truly transferable. You have to buy that specific TV, and it's a real limitation. I can't tell an 85-year-old person, you can do this on your TV, but please go buy a new one for $1,000. That's not a good solution. Affordability is not negotiable. I mean that. This has to be affordable. And a lot of the technology solutions that are being developed right now, and because they're early stage and because uh, they're not widely adopted yet, they're very pricey. They're very expensive. And you're going to end the game there. You, that not an easy question or an easy issue to address, but it has to be affordable. Um, support the adoption and integration process. If you hear one thing today, only one thing, this is what I want you to hear. Technology adoption in the older population has an incredible learning curve. We're not spending enough time researching how to do that effectively. We're not spending enough time supporting it. The companies kind of create the tools and say, well, senior care providers or those that, you know, classes here will help you adopt it. Any pilot I've ever run, and, and this is Davis Park who works with me, who's the director of the Front Porch Center for Technology, Innovation, and Wellbeing. We spend an upfront amount of time just teaching people how to use the technology and supporting them and helping them adopt it. No matter how interested the population is in using it or how experienced they are, that never goes away. And there's a real key reason for that I'm going to discuss in a minute. But see, for people who are entrepreneurs that are going to work in, in this space, you must be prepared to address this question. The reason, part of the reason why is the aging issues are real. I really, I mean, I got excited in Katie's 1.0 to 2.0 uh, um, chart. You know, she said we're going to design for all ages, which is great. But the reality is that the older adult population has some very specific needs when it comes to interacting with technology. I agree with, I was having a personal conversation with Katie, and she said, well, if you solve it there, it'll make it more easy for the whole population to adopt it. And that's, I 100% agree that. But Simple things. We've been testing uh, touchscreen tablets. Many older adults have limited uh, sensitivity in the fingertips and can't operate touchscreens, right? Seems like, oh, that should be so easy. It's not. We had a whole bunch, a whole pilot of people who were using touchscreen devices switch to using styluses because they just couldn't get it to respond to them. Vision is obviously an easy one, but here's one I don't hear people talking about. Cognitive impairment is really real. People, you can teach them how to use the technology, and for really fundamental reasons, they won't remember. So you have to, you can, you can address that, right? You can, it's all in the user interface and the simplicity with which you present it, or the support and materials that you provide that make it easy to kind of go back and use it. But this is something that has to really be seriously thought about in terms of being successful with technology in the older adult population. And it's a growing need. It's just getting started. It's going to become a bigger and bigger issue. Um, so those are some of the issues for aging, and there's many more in design. Uh, it's a multicultural world. I can't tell you the number of technologies I can't use in our work right now because they're only in English. And it's a real issue. Uh, it's, it seems like it should be a pretty easy problem for a technologist to solve, but they have to think about it up front and they have to build the multilingual capacity into their work. So that's why I'm excited to talk to a group like this because you're the future thinkers that are actually going to do this. Um, fail fast. I can't tell you the number of companies that we've done pilots with that have the right idea and they're working really hard, but they just don't want to admit it's not quite working. And that's actually a business strength. What I want to say is fail fast. Learn what's not working. Go back and reiterate. Don't give up the ghost, but don't keep going and hoping it's going to work. And I actually have gotten better at this in my career now about saying, love you, this is just not working. Right? Go back to the drawing board. There's no shame in that. And I think that we need to encourage more people to do that. 
Nobody really is excited to hear this, right? Because I think a good idea should just go to market and it should sell, but outcomes really helps. Like as someone who has to convince people to spend money, and I do a lot of that in my job, if the companies that come in with the outcomes data, even nothing substantial, but just meaningful outcomes data, it's a much easier conversation to have. Be a great partner. What do I mean by that? There are great companies that are starting to work in this space. Elizabeth Amini's company is a good example of this, who take a partnership approach. They don't just come in and try to sell you a product, but they want to come in and learn about your business and work with you and incorporate your learnings and your needs into what they're doing. Those are the companies that we're working with today, the ones that want to listen not only to us as an organization, but very specifically to the older adults we serve. Those companies are the ones that are going to, I think, win when all this is said and done. Lastly, a uh, couple things. Uh, be broadband enabled, but not broadband dependent. And that's a hard thing to say in this smartphone world. You know, everybody thinks, oh, internet connection is going to work. You know, <laughs> you've, like, in, in, like, just in some of our affordable housing buildings, they're 100 years old. Like, there's no signal there and in and getting through those walls anytime soon unless someone puts a repeater anywhere in there that there's no money to do that. Like, it's great to think that the internet is ubiquitous and it's everywhere, but it's not. And so you have to build applications that are internet enabled, broadband enabled, but not broadband dependent. Plan for scalable personalization. I kind of mentioned this up front, but we, I can't tell you the number of companies that have brought in solutions and have said, oh, it's customizable. It's great. And you say, well, I have this particular need for this particular population, yes. But when you really have the conversation, you say, for Mrs. Jones, I want to look at these things and track this data. And for Mr. Smith, I want to look at these things. And they're not the same, but they both represent the data points that are the well-being picture of this individual. It's very difficult to find people who can do that right now. That's a problem. And then if you want to scale that to hundreds of thousands of people, which is really the need of what we need to do, same problem. I know tons of senior living providers that are going to join that hackathon. They can't find anybody in the marketplace to do what they want right now. And they're literally forking over dollars for custom development to get stuff done because the developer marketplace just isn't there. I mean, talk to Katie. She's nodding up here in front. But there's a lot of people that have just thrown up their hands in frustration and said, OK, I'm just going to pay someone to do it just for me. That's sad. That's also a tremendous opportunity. Uh, well-being focus. No, healthcare is not fun. Nobody, I mean, while there's a lot of issues associated with health and aging, it's not a place people want to talk about. It's not a people, not a place people want to spend time on. It's a really tough conversation to have. Um, it, it's just. It's really difficult to get traction here. So if you want to do chronic disease monitoring or health monitoring, you got to find another way to talk about it. And as someone who does this every day, please take my word on this. Now my advice is the next bullet point. Fun works. Fun works. So this extra gaming uh, health technologies piece that a lot of people think, I, I think, honestly think is a fad, it's not. It actually works. It's the entry point for sustained use, which is the holy grail of this. If you want to sell something one time and have a subscription fee paid for a couple of months and just sell your good idea, if you really want to change behavior and have people do this over the long term, this sustained use piece has to get addressed. Fun, we're finding. The technologies that have that built in, and we've found them, are the way in the door. Um, and we can't pull people off those technologies. And we've had several really light bulb experiences right now where it's, we just uh, uh, completed a seven week pilot of a uh, recumbent bike with a virtual reality um, screen on the front of it. Now, if we'd sat down with our older adult population and said, how would you like a recumbent bike with a virtual reality avatar on it to help you exercise? The answer would have been no, <laughs> right? But. We introduced it in two of our fitness programs, and the, one of the first things they got to do was uh, play a game where, by riding the bike, the bike dragon went out and got, you know, little Pac-Man type experiences all over the screen, and and pretty soon we had uh, all kinds of people uh, interested in watching this, and more and more people getting into it. And then we embedded this in our approach of ecosystem, so we 
We created competitions um, where community members could all contribute to this without being singled out for their performance on the bike. And then we created competitions across communities where communities and teams of people were working against communities and teams of people. And pretty soon we had all these people exercising. 90 year olds riding 30 miles a week. People who hadn't exercised in 25 years up and doing this. And then the next thing was, um, you can't have this back. Um, and we just bought four. And we're not allowed to give them back and they want more. And really, fun was the way in the door here. But like the statistics are staggering. People age 84 that, and up that exercise is like 7%. The do cardiovascular exercise is a phenomenally small number. If we can start using solutions like this that embed fun, that get people excited, and, that, and do it in an, uh, like a community-based approach that takes away that fear of failure and being singled out for bad performance and makes the entry really easy and uh, gets people excited, then your sustained use problem just kind of evaporates. So those are some of the examples of the things we're thinking about, the things we're passionate about, things we hope that the entrepreneurs in this room will take to heart and uh, develop around. And uh, we'd love to support you. We do this all the time. Uh, we believe that it's literally going to take a village um, to really get this going. That's the tipping point that hasn't happened yet. Um, and we're here to collaborate and help everyone get going. We think the voice of the older adult is a key way into this. We represent 6,000 lives that really want to have a voice and that are really organized to do that. We'd be pleased to work with you. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, we have time for a couple questions. OK, good questions. Oh, long answers. Um, Okay, the first thing is well-being. I guess my point on well-being is that I think that a lot of um, the technologies, technologies I see um, coming into uh, the old, the aging space are caregiver focused and health care focused. And our, our experience is, is that it's a tough sell. It's not a conversation people really are excited to have. So that if you can take the same solutions and kind of recast them or rebrand them from a well-being focus, it's a much easier conversation to have. So we're not saying don't do it. We're just saying how you approach it and talk about it makes a has a significant impact on the sales process and also the adoption process. So that's that part. In terms of um, things that don't work, um, uh, the ratio of things that work that don't work, Hmm. We have a couple different answers to that. I would say we've never met a technology that we don't want to change. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Davis, would you agree? Yeah. Um, there are very few home runs in this space right now at all. I think that um, the way we view it is that most need work, and that's why we want to work with companies that want to come alongside us and learn and that are willing to adapt. In terms of outright failures, I think we've been lucky. I don't think we've had a ton of those, but I can, I can give one example where we did uh, digital health and wellness assessments. And um, because we couldn't customize those to the person, to personalize those to the person, um, they were widely dismissed as not um, not worth answering. You know, we were working with a population of about 100 people. And in that, that was the same pilot where uh, the touch screen, where we were presenting the digital health and wellness assessments, was roundly dismissed because it was difficult for older adults to operate, no matter what we did with it. So um, that's it. A case where it's actually a technology where the company is going back and retooling it. And I think the next round is going to blow people away. And that's an example where failing worked. Um, and I don't see that as a failure. I see that as resilient change and good learnings. Um, but we have had those. Yeah, I mean, that's such a huge question. I mean, that's, that's the whole startup business promise investor, you know, where's the pile of money? Where's the people to work on it question? Um, I, I would say, though, that you're a step ahead of most people if you're coming in with outcomes data already. And, and pilot experience already and all the learnings so that you can streamline and kind of talk to the investor community about what you already know, right? That makes you credible from the beginning.